our December ASCE uh, virtual meeting. Um, still not sure when we'll be switching back, but hopefully as things improve, it'll be soon. Um, so we'll definitely keep you posted. Um, without uh, any further ado, I'll turn it over to Haley to introduce our speaker. Thanks, James. Our guest speaker for the December presentation is Travis Bartholomew, Operations Director for the Road Commission of Kalamazoo County. Travis has over 26 years of experience at the RC Casey with oversight of road maintenance, engineering, equipment, and facilities. Travis began his career at the RC Casey as a road maintenance operator in February of 1995 and has since advanced to area superintendent, general superintendent, and is currently the operations director. Travis leads num numerous innovative and cost-effective solutions to everyday challenges working with the RCKC team to think creatively and integrate technology, materials, equipment, and field experience into creative projects. Mr. Bartholomew, Bartholomew, Bartholomew will be presenting on the recent flooding concerns in Kalamazoo County and the unique repairs the RCKC has come up with to open the flooded roadways. Travis will dive into each unique scenario and how the multiple sites on the RCKC's roadway system have been modified to open flooded roads to traffic and or allow access to residents. He'll share the various flooding repairs and talk about the conditions and circumstances that caused each, sol each solution to be unique. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Travis. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me. We're having some technical difficulties this morning. Of all times, um, here at the Road Commission, our our uh, internet is down, so I am unable to connect um, from my desktop. So we are trying to work this through my iPhone, and then Haley's going to advance us through the slides. So um, I assume everybody can hear me all right. I can barely hear you folks, so if there's questions, um, you might have to speak up for me. So. Um, as Haley, Haley mentioned, my name is Travis Bartholomew. I'm the Operations Director at the Road Commission of Kalamazoo County. Um, I was asked to, to speak today to your group regarding some innovative type um, repairs we've done on flooded roads uh, to try to get them open to traffic um, without spending a significant amount of time and, and effort and, and dollars. Um, knowing that um, with flooding, um, typically that flooding situation goes away in time and um, you know, is it really the best fix to, to do more of a, a long term, long range type repair at all these locations? So, um, Haley, you want to advance? So this is what we run into. Um, if you drive I-94 in Kalamazoo County, um, you should be able to see this one or seen this one up until just recently. This is the typical situation we've ran into here um, in Kalamazoo County, and I'm sure throughout Southwest Michigan and even probably even parts of um, the rest of Michigan too, is we've experienced since 2018, significant amount of water, um, storm events, high water table. And with that has caused our wetland areas um, to charge and in lots of, of sections of road flood the entire road. Um, but what's unique about this is because of the high water table, it's, it's for a long period of time. So um, this is a, a great example, just a short section of road, it's underwater, there's actually two sections um, just in this mile of, of road that are underwater, road is closed. Um, we have struggles with residents um, trying to access um, their houses. So in this photo here, you see on the left side, the guardrail opens up, that's actually a driveway to a house. So obviously that person, um, I think he's walking to his house or has been until recently. Um, we just repaired this area about a month ago. So no outlet, um, you know, again, roads closed for a long period of time, um, struggles with our residents being able to access their houses. And then of course, you know, as that water lies on the road for a long period of time, um, there's that deteriorated HMA surface that, you know, when the water does go down, it doesn't simply uh, typically mean we can just open the road. So there's usually a project that goes along with it. Okay, Haley. Can you advance the slide, please, Haley? Oh, I'm sorry. I got to keep up with you. All right. Um, I really want to focus on a project today that we're very proud of. 
Um, and it's something that has evolved from the first fix we've done in 2018 to where we are today. So we've learned from our experience um, and every situation's a little bit different. But before I get into that, I just want to recap um, a couple highlights from some projects, some situations over the past few years with this um, excessive amount of flooding and, and high water tables. So um, not a very good photo here, but really wanted to share. This is Texas Township in Kalamazoo County, um, Eagle Lake. Um, this photo is actually of an intersection. Um, there's an island out in the center of this lake called Treasure Island, and there's a causeway to it. Um, and the water on this um, Eagle Lake has, has risen um, since 2018, approximately four feet. So there's many areas within this island um, section of the road that have been underwater for a, a significant period of time. So the lake, in essence, is higher than the road out in this island. So some of the challenges here, um, we obviously had to block the storm sewer system and then continually pump water from the inland part of this island to dewater it so um, we could maintain traffic um, residents access to their their uh, houses um, along with um, there was some assistance indirectly where we were actually taking water from people's basements um, that was being pumped out into the yards and into the road and then we would have to repump it um, into the the lake so um, very challenging situation here um, the next piece to this that's important to understand is even though we had the pumps in place and the storm system, storm water system blocked, excuse me, um, we still had to deal with two factors and that's significant storm events, right? Because we didn't have a storm um, system and also the pumps would not keep up with a significant amount of rain over a short period of time. So we could flood just from the rain event. So to offset that, not only did we block the sewers and, and uh, pump the water, but we also put in some temporary um, aggregate lifts through sections of these roads and cul-de-sacs and the causeway. So if the pumps didn't keep up or it was in the middle of winter and the pumps wouldn't work because it was too cold, they were froze, at least the residents would have access to their properties. Um, what it didn't do is if the pumps weren't running, um, some of these residents would flood. Um, they were protected from the lakeside, but really the road commission indirectly was protecting them on the interior side of the lake. All right, Haley. Next slide. Okay, so this is uh, also Eagle Lake, um, another challenge on the opposite side of the lake. Um, the, the water has risen in the lake enough that it's migrated out around the houses and um, engulfed a, a section of this road. So there's approximately seven residents here that didn't have access um, to their houses. Also um, on the left in this wooded area, there was a few residents that were actually taking a significant amount of water from some springs uphill. So they had lake water coming from one way and springs coming from the other. So they were uh, they're in a real tough situation. Um, next slide, please. So again, this is um, Eagle Lake Drive again, um, same as the last slide. Um, you can see around the truck, um, even in front of these houses, um, that's standing water, that's lake water. So these houses were, when we showed up this morning, were actually appeared to be out in the lake, um, including the road. So our charge for the day was to um, build this temporary road through the water um, so we could at least start to gain access to the residents and they could start um, diking around their, their properties and pumping. So this is some of our, our first experiences with um, the aggregate lift. But in these areas, um, they're temporary. As a matter of fact, this one's still in place today. Um, the, the Lake Association's working on a, a permanent outlet, a long-term solution. So um, until that's done, uh, this temporary road is in place. But again, this road um, really just allows access to a few residents. Um, so it was a, a paved road, HMA road. Now it's just temporary gravel. It's elevated. All right, next slide. 
So this is our, our highlight project I want to talk about today. So this is uh, 8th Street um, North ML between ML and KL Avenue in Kalamazoo County. Uh, it's a local road, um, but it does have a significant amount of traffic. So close to 2000 cars a day. Um, the challenges here are, first of all, you can see a significant amount of water still on the road um, and it's up about a foot deep. This photo was taken in late September of 2020. So the water had gone down. At one point, it was almost um, to the, the height of the guardrail. Um, and also this section of road in between these rails is very narrow. Um, currently, um, this system, the guardrail system, I think was 25 feet between the, the guardrails. So um, not a lot of room to narrow it up as we raise the road. Okay, next slide. So I just want to talk through some some options, um, what to consider when we look at roads that are flooded. Um, you know, really, what are we looking to do? And what's the vision? Long term? Um, do we do a, a long term type fix? Should it be very temporary, like I showed you with the aggregate lifts? Um, you know, it, everybody always wants to say, what's the what's the fix? What's the permanent fix? And with a, a flooded road, I'm not sure there ever is a, a permanent fix because you never know. If the permanent fix um, may not be if the water continues to rise. So, but somewhere in between very temporary, which you've seen with our, our gravel lifts and a long term fix, which um, we can show you some some long term fixes that we have done um, somewhere. You know, there has to be a decision made as to you know, how much we're going to invest. So that's when we get into the, the budget section of it is, you know, we're talking these sections are typically rather short, typically less than a thousand feet long, you know, a wetland or lake type area. Um, but we could still easily invest hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars um, in projects in these types of areas. So um, we all know our entire systems are, are stressed, our road systems, and, and how much do we budget for these type of fixes that really only address a short section of road. And then there's always the risk um, you know, as we make these decisions and, and we utilize the, the public funds, you know, trying to decide what is the best fix and how much are we going to spend? Um, it's a moving target at all times. So some of the things we have to consider uh, user delay. Um, you know, and it changes obviously based on the, the type of road. So if it's a high traffic road, um, it's very critical to get it open. But, you know, in some of these situations um, that the road commissions ran into, these are local roads. Um, sure, user delay, it stops the commuter traffic completely if the road's closed. Um, you know, there's some delay for the residents in the areas. They may have to drive around the block. Um, there's also concerns with emergency response, uh, concerns with uh, the school busing system, delivery trucks. So there are delays there to consider. And then uh, the next piece um, we always look at too is, is the engineering side. Um, you know, looking at the type of fix that we're going to do, um, do we need to have it engineered? You know, if it's temporary, probably not, but some of the long term fi fixes um, depends on how much we're investing. Um, absolutely, there's cost and, and there's time in doing that. Um, and then, of course, we love this piece. Um, the Eagle process and the permitting process is typically we're in a lake or, or some sort of a wetland area. So um, we always have to contact Eagle and and get their blessing or, or go through their processes um, to get a permit. And of course, you know, that goes back to budget, um, the type of fix and user delay. So it has a lot to do with the project. And then we move to construction and, you know, that's the next question, you know, it's a risk is what type of material are we going to use to, to repair this area or to improve it? Is it going to be concrete? Is it going to be wood? Is it just going to be aggregate steel? You know, how are we going to build the structure? What's going to be the, the best fix um, long term? And then at the end of the day, um, you know, if we do have a project, um, there's always the question from the public and, and even our road partners and, and our townships and cities and villages is what's the guarantee? You know, if we're going to spend 200,000, 500,000, $2 million on a, a project um, to lift a road, what's the guarantee that our investment um, is made and that road won't flood again. And that's a, a tough one to answer because 
I'm not sure we can guarantee that the road would never flood again, even with a significant investment. Okay, Haley, next slide. All right, so again, back to the, the project that we really want to highlight today. Um, this one's near and dear to our heart because it had a lot of challenges to it. This is the 8th Street project um, the day we started it. So you can see still a significant amount of water area. Um, this, this flooded area was approximately 500 feet long. Um, and when we started the project, um, the water level was just at the bottom of the guardrail at the lowest point. All right, next slide. And then from there, um, I just jumped straight ahead. Um, this is the finished project three weeks later. So um, I'm gonna, I got a series of slides. I want to talk through the process on how we got from a foot of water to a, a finished road in just a short period of time. Okay, Haley, next slide. So to start the process, you know, like I'd mentioned before, um, the road was flooded, um, significant amount of water. So it had its challenges right off the bat because we had to work in the water. Um, there was no dewatering on this project. So immediately our first um, effort was to get our team up and out of the water. Okay, next slide. So here we are. Um, this is the first two days on the project. Um, what we had learned from the other lifts that we've done over the years, and, and I'll go back and talk about a few of them, particularly the original one we started with in 2018. Um, but what we learned immediately was we really need to, to look at our current infrastructure, our surroundings, what's out there now, what can be used and reused on the project versus just tearing it all down and starting over. So in this case, we had an HMA surface that was in rather good condition, even though it was underwater. Um, we had a guardrail system that um, was relatively, I don't say new, but good condition. The rail was straight, the posts weren't rotted, um, it had quite a bit of life left to it. Um, so we were able to salvage both of those um, with our, our fix. So with that, what we had learned is um, as we start to build these lifts with um, the EGLE process and permitting is from what we've understood um, with EGLE, with their, their field people, is we really don't need a permit if we stay within the toe of the slope. So our goal is to build a road up, not out. And there are limitations to going up. We all know that because as you get higher, you need to support it with more width. Um, but there was some things in place that uh, we were able to utilize to help us go at least three feet in the air without adding um, significant width. So really what we needed to do is stay within the toe of the slope. So with that, what we learned is the guardrail system um, that was already in place makes a, a pretty good retaining wall. So we leave the, the guardrail in place and this here are our, our crews um, installing a second rail underneath the current guardrail. I know you can barely see it because it's mostly underwater. This was in the, I think the deepest point. Um, so we, we put a second row of used guardrail underneath the current guardrail and fasten it to the wood post to help contain the aggregate lift as we start adding material. Okay, Haley, next slide. So as you can see here, um, this is a couple days later. This is after we have all the uh, second layer of guardrail installed underneath the current rail. Um, first step in the process, um, completely in the water, so it's it's kind of a slow go. Um, but this is the key piece to, to building this lift. All right, next slide. So once that, that second layer of rail is in place, our next next task is um, we want to install this geotextile fabric um, around the perimeter of this lift. So you can see our crew rolling out the fabric. Um, so we're letting it submerse in the water and then draping the access over the, the guardrail. Uh, we do this for two reasons. First of all, it contains our aggregate within the lift area so nothing spills out into the wetland. And it also helps contain any sediment um, from the aggregate as we, we start to place the aggregate in the water. Okay, next slide. Um, so really just another photo 
showing um, the fabric being placed and uh, you can see how well it's containing um, the area that we're going to lift. Next slide. So once the fabric's in place, uh, the next step is to start building that aggregate lift. Um, we have found that the 9A aggregate has worked well in all of our situations in water. Um, it is a uh, crushed stone, native stone. We can get it local here in Kalamazoo. Um, it's like an inch, just an inch and a half diameter crush. Um, it's rather clean. Uh, it does have a little bit, you can see a little um, dust to it yet, but it's basically just pure stone. Um, it's very difficult to drive on, so we typically use track machines to place the stone, um, but I'll get through the process and how we can start to maneuver our equipment over the top of these lifts here in a minute. So the first step here is um, to get out of the water. So this is the day we all get excited and get to take our boots off. Um, so we have raised the road just above the current water level at this point, which is right between the two levels of guardrail. Okay, next slide. So you can see the first layer of, of 9A in place. Um, I think we had a rain event that night, so it cleaned our stone off real nice for us. Uh, the next step in the process, you see these cables laying across the, the um, aggregate there. Um, they're actually tied to the guardrails on both sides of the road. So we've ran um, guard, or excuse me, these cables from one side to the other, fasten the, the guardrails in 12 foot intervals to help support um, the rail as it takes the pressure from that aggregate as we begin to lift this road. Okay, next slide, Haley. So this is just a close up of the cable um, as it's wrapped around the, the existing guardrail post. You can see it's it's attached just below the top rail. Um, it's tensioned um, slightly just to take the slack out of it um, over to the guardrail on the other side. Next slide, Haley. So you can see the series of of guard or excuse me of cables there, and then the next step um, once we get all those cables in place, now we're going to place another layer of 9A stone over the top. So we're in essence going to barrier embed these cables um, in the center of this lift. Next slide. So here we are in the process. Um, have to be somewhat cautious because we can't dig into the existing bed. Um, we're just basically placing more 9A over the top um, in this lift. Next slide, Haley. I got a couple slides here just showing the process of us placing the 9A. Um, so the 9A in, uh, in the lowest area um, where the existing rail is was right at the top of the guardrail. All right, next slide, Haley. So again, just finishing up, um, getting this 9A to grade. Um, this lift, um, we've opted to do this in, in all the, the lifts um, to make them flat. So if it's going to flood anywhere, it's going to flood everywhere. Um, and we've done that simply because if we put a low spot in it, that's where it's going to flood first. And we might as well have moved the, the high spot to the low spot and gain a little more elevation. So. Um, we've had enough room in between the, the hills and, and all of our locations to be able to blend these back in and get them to ride. So um, as far as, you know, the survey and shooting and elevations, um, basically what we did is we found the highest um, water level that we experienced and then said, OK, we need to be a foot higher than that for finished grade. So in this case, um, it was above um, the lowest point of the existing guardrail. So this one was rather deep. OK, next slide. And again, um, just another photo of of us placing the 9A um, in between the guardrails. All right, Haley, next photo. And then once the 9A is in place and graded um, to the elevation that we determined, um, we then choke that 9A with a layer of 21 AA directly on top of it. Um, usually six to eight inches is adequate to, to at least get um, our construction traffic over the top of it. So um, you can see here, um, 
or compacting this as we go, um, getting this up to grade. So we're pretty much in most places are at the top of the existing guardrail or pretty close to it. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'm still working on the on the 21 AA, but what I wanted to share here, because you're going to see it in, in a lot of these photos, you're going to say, what the heck is that? Um, you see off to the right, there's a, a culvert protruding out um, into the swamp. It's a little 12 inch culvert um, and it needs to be cut off, but it was placed there and it was placed on top of the existing road. So before we started the, the aggregate lift and it was a, a suggestion from Eagle um, for a critter crossing. So that's the purpose of the that small culvert. All right, next slide. So this is a close up view um, after we got the gravel on this this lift. So you can see the existing guardrail. You can see the lower um, rail that we added um, and then the, of course the upper rail and then how that fabric um, contains the, the sediment and the, the stone within the lift area. Um, my folks like to call it the burrito, but um, anyways, it seems to work well at, at separating the wetland area from our lift. Okay, next slide. All right, so now that we've built the road up, um, we have a gravel surface to work on. The next step um, in this particular project was guardrail. Um, we needed to, to build the guardrail um, prior to finishing any additional support we needed to do on the embankment. Um, this was somewhat unique too because um, this is not our crew, this is a contractor um, that we have to share our, our vision um, on this situation and they were willing to improvise and, and do something out of the norm with their crew to help build this um, guardrail system. So what's different and unique about this is the new guardrail is actually built on top of the old guardrail. Um, so we're actually driving new posts and we actually use um, long posts. These are extra long nine foot posts, um, but we're driving nine foot steel posts adjacent to the existing wood posts. And then also, um, if you look closely, there's two holes drilled about halfway down the post. Um, the contractor drilled those holes on site and uh, you'll see a couple photos here on the next couple slides, but we actually bolted and attached the new post to the existing wood post. All right, next slide, Haley. As you can see, this is the process where we're drilling the holes um, ahead of pounding the post. All right, next slide. And this is a, a close up, right, of, of the new post being driven adjacent to the existing post, just outside of the old rail. All right, next slide. And then once that post is in place, you see the two holes line up uh, and that's where we we attach the two posts together. OK, next slide. OK, so now all the posts are up. And the guys are working on putting the bolts in. OK, next slide. And then now we're putting the rail on and you can see um, if you look down where the two posts meet, the bolts are in place and the new rail is being placed on the on the steel posts with the new blockouts. So actually the the new um, width between guardrail actually increased by a few inches just because the, the posts weren't quite as big. OK, next slide. So the next, I think, two slides really are just showing um, the guardrail in place. You can still see a little bit of the old guardrail protruding up in a couple areas, um, but also it appears that the new rail is still a little bit high because we still got a little bit of gravel to place and our HMA surface. Okay, next slide. Okay, just another photo of um, that gravel section just before um, the next step, next slide. So the next step in the process um, was to reinforce the slope and help reinforce the guardrail. Um, we used a, a really large limestone uh, for this, this part of the project. You can see these are 
sometimes four foot and larger type rocks, very angular. Um, so we place them, next slide. So we place them with an excavator, um, just one rock at a time on the back side of the guardrail and stack them on the, the floor slope. So quite a process. So we went almost a thousand feet with this, this process. I think it took us like four, maybe five days to do it. Okay, next slide. So you can see this is one side complete. Um, they actually stack very well, um, but there are a, a lot of large voids still in between the rocks. Um, next slide, Haley. So then we come back with a, a 68, six to eight inch limestone and uh, we choke those big voids with a smaller rock. Next slide, Haley. So you can see this is after the small stone is placed. Um, you can still see a little bit of the old rail in spots. Um, you see the fabric still separating the, the lift from even the riprap on the outside and the two posts bolted together. So we're just finishing up this part of the process. Okay, next slide. And then once all the rip wraps in place, uh, we come back and, and dress up the gravel surface and fine grade it for asphalt. So we're adding a couple more inches of 21 double A. Next slide. And then uh, the next couple slides uh, is the HMA process. So two lists of hot mix asphalt on uh, 36 A on this project. Um, our goal was to pave as wide as we could. So we got the paver and the rollers as close to the guardrail as possible. Um, that gave us approximately 23 foot of, of asphalt. So there was a little bit of a void between the asphalt um, and the riprap. Um, you can slowly just go through the next two slides. So this is again the, the HMA process. We're just finishing up the hot mix asphalt here. Okay, next slide, Haley. So this is that um, shoulder area I was talking about where you know, we had that gap between the, the rip wrap and the, the HMA. Um, you can still see a little bit of the guardrail, old guardrail protruding off. So um, we filled this area in with a, a one to two inch limestone. Um, it's mostly underneath the rail, um, maybe just a little bit in front, but you really couldn't put a, a wheel path in it. Next slide. And then from there, this is the project with the shoulders on it. And next slide, Haley. And this is the project complete and it took us about three weeks to do it. And um, I don't have the final numbers yet, but um, it's approximately 500 feet long and it's coming in somewhere just under $200,000. So relatively inexpensive to, to raise a road that that long, approximately three feet. Okay, next slide. All right, this is a totally different project. I just got a, a few highlights from a couple of the previous projects that we've, we've done. Um, this one was a little unique because um, the gravel, the, the aggregate temporary lift was somewhat in place already um, when we come back to finish this project. So the road was closed, but there was a, a few residents access. So we temporarily built the road up with gravel for most of a year, um, just to allow access to those couple residents. And then we come back the following year and decided the water wasn't gonna go away. Let's, um, let's throw another lift in here and get this road open back up. So in this situation, you can see the wetland area off to the left. Um, on the opposite side of the road, there was no wetland area. So it was right on the edge of a, a swamp. Um, the current guardrail was um, poor condition. So we ended up just completely removing the old guardrail. Um, con our contractor installed new rail with, with the nine foot post, the extra long post. And then we took the old rail and fastened it underneath the, the new rail to the, the new post, as you see here, again, to, to contain the, that aggregate lift because we really need to finish it um, so it's full width. So we installed the, the lower rail. Um, we placed the, the fabric in that void um, to keep the aggregate from spilling out. We, uh, next slide, Haley. Um, you see here, we also back the new rail up with large riprap and choked it with some smaller stone. Um, 
but in this situation, uh, there wasn't a lot supporting this rail. And uh, with the experience we had with the cable on 8th Street, um, we thought it would be a, a good idea to, to support this rail also. So um, you see here the cable tied um, to the, the lower rail and the post, and it's supported across the road. Next slide, Haley. Um, where there is no guardrail, but we drove those same nine foot posts, 12 foot on center, um, across from uh, the, the cables that we attached on the opposite side. So then we were able to put the cables across the road, um, again, embedded in the 9A stone and allowing uh, the, the posts on the opposite side to support the other side of the road. Next slide, Holly, excuse me, Haley. So this is a close up um, of those posts that we drove. So it's nine feet in the ground. There's about um, five, six inches sticking up. Um, we cut just a, a slot in, in one of the flanges and bent it over. Um, that really was just to keep the cable from sliding off the top. Um, then we just looped the cable around this side and tensioned it, and, and it helped support the opposite side of the road. All right, next slide. So this is um, that section of road um, almost complete. We're paving it at this point. So you can see the, the whole cable system is totally buried. Uh, wouldn't know it was there today. So uh, this was, a again, they're all a little bit unique and a little different. So. Okay, next slide. All right, so now I'm going backwards. Um, this is actually uh, the first um, temporary lift, and we call them temporary at first, and sometimes I wonder if they're not temporary. Um, some of them may be long term. Um, this was our first attempt at trying to get a road open again um, that was flooded. So this is uh, down in Prairie Run Township, um, just south of Texas Township at Harrison Lake. And it was actually ended up being three areas um, that were flooded and roads closed um, from this Harrison Lake. And this is the first one that flooded. Um, this is a primary road. Um, it's also a part of our all season network and it is an um, emergency route for US 131. So um, it was closed for uh, most of a year. Um, and we work, we're working through um, a design to do a, a long term type fix on this. Um, some concerns and, and holding the, the process up through Eagle, trying to figure out how to do this. And, and of course, the budget to support it was um, just alarming. So um, we decided to come out here with our own crew and, and open this road and try to do something what we called temporary. We called it a temporary fix. So uh, this situation, it was actually a, a rather long lift, but there was a short section. It was about 150 feet long and quite a dip in the road where the equalizer culvert was, and that's where it, it had flooded completely across the road. So again, like all the other lifts, the first step in the process, and it's hard to see in this, this photo, but um, we added a second layer of guardrail underneath the existing guardrail. You can see the fabric um, that was laid on the road and drooped over the rail. And then in this situation, you can see we built the 9A stone up just on the, the shoulder area or the edge of the road. Next slide, Haley. And we did that so we um, could continue to work on the, the asphalt surface because the 9A is very hard to maneuver in with equipment unless it's a track machine. Um, so this, the short section um, that we needed to lift significantly, um, we knew we were gonna pretty much bury the guardrail completely. So we added a, a short section of these used highway barriers um, to help contain the temporary road um, in this area. Okay, next slide. So you can see um, there's five lengths of barrier on each side of the road. Um, and then also now we filled the 9A in in between, um, connecting the two sides together. So this area is just, it's flat, um, ready for the next step. Haley, next slide, please. So we opted to put um, wood mats through this area, and we did um, for two reasons. First of all, we had um, little to no experience with this type of work. So we wanted to um, throw a, a second round of reinforcement in here, more of a guarantee that this thing was going to last more than a couple weeks. Because um, again, we had not had the experience doing this um, previously. Um, but also just looking at the existing road, this is where um, the shoulders were sloughing off. There was some significant cracking 
um, even prior to the flooding. So this area has probably got some organic soil underneath it that continues to move and we wanted to be able to bridge that area. So um, we actually started renting these these um, mats, but um, they're still there today and that was three years ago. So um, currently we own them. Okay, next slide, please. So once the, the mats were placed, we also, um, just to make sure everything um, didn't separate and if it was going to move, it was moving together. Um, we stitched all the mats together. Okay, next slide. So you can see the stitching and then you see the next step in the process. Um, we put a layer of geotextual fabric over the top of the mats even um, and then started to continue our aggregate lift. Um, this lift was um, approximately 700 feet long, um, but the last um, half of it was done with just gravel because it was at a higher elevation. So, um, all right, next slide, please. And this is uh, finishing up this project. So this is the uh, the hot mix asphalt. Um, you see, we're getting late in the year. This gentleman's dressed pretty warm. So um, this is probably mid October in 2018. Okay, next slide. And then the last piece of this project um, was to install guardrail again because we pretty much buried most of the, the existing guardrail and the lift. Um, in this situation, we did not use cables. This was again the first one we've done. Um, and in the area that there was a significant amount of fill, we used those concrete um, highway barriers. But we did install new guardrail. Um, and we actually installed it inside of the existing guardrail, so it didn't narrow the, the footprint of the road, um, but we were still able to maintain two 11 foot lanes and uh, probably a foot, foot and a half a shoulder on each side. So um, we do have some signage there that the road narrows, but again, we are still maintaining two, two lanes of traffic. Okay, next slide. Uh, not a very good photo, but it's all I could find. Uh, of the, the finished road and this was the day we opened it. So um, it's really not that humpy and squiggly, but um, I think the pavement markers didn't do us much good that day. Okay, next slide. All right, um, this is another area. I just come across this photo, so I thought I'd share. Um, this is when we started getting good at it. This was the third one we've done. Um, this was uh, another primary road. It was closed for over a year and a half. Um, and same type of process here. Uh, we put the additional guardrail, the fabric, the 9A stone to lift it, choked it with 21AA. Um, again, the, the asphalt on top and then riprap underneath the new guardrails and those guardrails um, were installed inside of the existing rail that we buried. So this road did get somewhat narrower also. Um, this is probably a good example of a road that um, this will be long term. It's primary road, but it's not a high traffic primary. Um, we still have two full lanes of traffic and uh, this lift will probably be there for a long time. So. All right, uh, I think that was it. So I'm sure there's probably a few questions. Travis, I have a question for you. Uh, this is Steve Walkus. Um, 9A is not a standard M dot aggregate anymore, but I think it may have been in the past, like some others, 31A, which is no longer listed. Um, what was the typical size again for 9A? Uh, it's usually that inch to inch and a half. Um, it seems to hang out on the higher end, um, the inch and a half. It's a pretty large crush. It's, it's very difficult to drive a, a vehicle in. OK, so my guess is that would be is, that's different than a 6A, which is like a concrete course aggregate. Right, so the 6A is typically more of a round stone that's not crushed. Gotcha. Um, this is almost entirely crushed, so it locks together rather well. OK. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Travis, this is uh, James Smith. I was curious if you have had 
any issues with frost heave or anything with having so much water kind of moving underneath the roadway? Well, what's interesting, um, we have not, um, but, you know, typically in these situations, you know, there had to be a significant amount of ice um, to be able to do that. So um, we've not ran into that situation yet. Um, and I'm not sure we will at this point. Um, 8th Street's going to be one to watch because the water level is higher than it has been on the other projects. Um, all the other projects, the water has resided and currently is not even on the, um, the old existing road. Um, but 8th Street will be one to watch just for that that situation. Travis, this is Steve again. I've got one more. Um, on those cable cross ties that you uh, put in to help reinforce those old guardrail uh, posts in the guardrail itself, what, did you guys do any engineering analysis on the size of that cable or connections or forces being applied or just kind of a rule of thumb um, type of thing? Yeah, it's it's a rule of thumb. It was more overkill just to make sure it would last. Um, you know, I anticipate the life of those cables because it's not it's not stainless cable. It's not even galvanized. Um, of course, you know, not knowing the loading on the clamps. Um, but there, there isn't a lot of side stress on this because that stone stacks rather well. Um, I think long term, um, if you was to dig that up, you probably see eventually that that cable will deteriorate and rust away. Um, but by that time, everything is settled in place and, you know, the riprap will help support um, the new road. So, um, you know, my guess is that cable has probably got a 20 year lifespan. Gotcha. Thanks. Any other questions for Travis? All right. Well, Travis, we thank you for taking the time out of your day um, to give us this presentation about the flooding in Kalamazoo. I think it's a unique, a unique, a unique look at ways to get roads open um, cost effectively and within a short time frame. And you guys have several roadways in the county. So I'm sure there'll be more that you guys will be looking at. And it might be something that other road commissions and municipalities could look at and engineers can think of as they go through and do design for their clients. Okay, well, I appreciate you having me in today and hopefully the information I shared would be helpful um, to all the engineers and as they look at projects in the future. Sounds good. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, right, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Yes. Everybody have a good Thanks day. Thanks everyone for tuning in today and we all um, hope you have a safe and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and we'll see you guys back in January.